A great deal of ink, perhaps digital ink, has been spilled on the question of how exactly today's advancements in artificial intelligence are going to impact writing and journalism. But what exactly is that change going to look like? What do we want it to look like? And how should AI researchers and journalists react to what is happening today? I think there are a few people better positioned to think about some of these questions than Nick Thompson. Nick is currently the CEO of The Atlantic, which rounds out his perspective as having been an editor, writer, and executive in the journalism industry. While we get to Nick's thoughts on AI and what's happening right now, a lot of this conversation is also about Nick's life and career. His perspectives on what it is to be an editor or to do good journalism will certainly inform how I think about myself as somebody who writes and edits writing going forward. I hope you'll find Nick's perspectives thoughtful and informative about the human components of writing and journalism. This is The Gradient Podcast, and I'm your host, Daniel Bashir. If you're listening to this and you're not subscribed to The Gradient in some way, I think you should go fix that. You can subscribe to the podcast on your usual podcast player to make sure you get episodes when I release them every week. And if you want to get the rest of what we put out on The Gradient, that means this podcast, our newsletter, and articles from our online magazine, then you can subscribe to us through Substack. And finally, if you like what we're doing, it would really mean a lot to all of us if you consider sharing this or whatever else you like on The Gradient. We're a pretty small team, this podcast is a one-man effort, and the entire Gradient publication is run by a very small group of dedicated volunteers. So whenever you do share our things around, when you leave comments for us, when you give us feedback, we all really, really appreciate it. But now, without further ado, Nick... Thompson. So Nick, this is actually a little bit kind of surreal for me to be speaking to you just because I've been a reader of The Atlantic since I was in high school. And so um, you have had really just one of the most incredible careers in journalism by any standards. And I'd like to hear a little bit about where this all began. Why did you choose to go into journalism as a career? Sure. Well, thank you for having me here. It's a little surreal, too, given the quality of the other guests you have. Um, I went into journalism almost haphazardly. I've been thinking about it a lot because the person who hired me, um, Charlie Peters, rest in peace, um, died last week at age 96. But I, um, I had done some journalism in college, but not as a reporter, just as an op-ed writer. And I created a magazine for conservatives and liberals on campus to argue with each other and debate complicated issues. Um, but I wasn't sure what I wanted to do when I finished college. I just wanted to do something interesting. And I struggled for a while um, to get a job. And it was that, you know, a job interview where I, uh, yeah, I showed up and I was like, my hair wasn't brushed and I was wearing a sweater and my pants didn't fit. And the woman who was interviewing me, I think it was for an environmental activist group, said, you should work at the Washington Monthly. Um, you know, how she knew it, how she knew that like my personality would fit it. I'd never heard of the Washington Monthly. But I went home, I looked it up, I sent them a letter, they assigned me a story, I applied, and then amazingly, maybe six months later, they hired me as one of two editors. And so suddenly I had a great job in journalism. And that was where it all started. There have been some ups and downs, but um, I started there when I was 24 years old. And it was this incredible spot where Charlie Peters, the founder, owner, would hire young journalists work them as hard as I've ever worked in my career. And the trade-off was, you know, the cost is you get paid very little and you work very hard. And the benefit is you get to edit and write stories that people read and you're part of this incredible network. And I was delighted for that trade-off. What does it mean that the Washington Monthly was a personality fit for you? What did, what did that look like? I think that what that woman saw, I don't even remember who it was or where it was. I think what she saw in me at Nick Thompson, age 24, was that I was ambitious, energetic. I wanted to do something important and interesting, but I didn't have the polish or knowledge of the world to fit into a normal organization. Like It wasn't going to work for me to be hired at 
I don't know, let's say it was the Sierra Club and try to like work my way through the organization. I just didn't, it wasn't gonna work, right? Like I needed to go someplace a little idiosyncratic. Uh, and so she thought of the Washington Monthly. And since then, you've spent time at NewYorker.com. You were editor-in-chief at, the Wire, at Wired before coming to The Atlantic. So besides being a journalist, you've now sort of had some different vantage points from which to view the industry, right? As an editor, as now an executive. Can you tell me a little bit about just how perhaps being in those different positions has kind of rounded out your view of, of what the journalism industry is and perhaps some of your own values when it comes to journalism? It's a great question. Um, you know, so I started out, I was a writer, I was an editor, then I was mostly a writer, then I was mostly an editor. And then I was a full-time editor at The New Yorker when I started there. Um, and then gradually, while I was at The New Yorker, I was there from 2010 to 2017, um, I gradually started taking on bureaucratic responsibilities, helping to run their, launch their iPad app, their iPhone app, um, then overseeing the website, overseeing you know, expansion of the archives, launch the paywall. I got very involved in the business. So sort of every six months, I would add on a new bureaucratic task or a new management task and, you know, drop out some of the editing or some of the writing. And, and then I went to Wired where it was very much, I was the editor in chief, but I was also, you know, responsible for a large part of the budget. And then here where I'm just responsible for the budget. What I've learned in that is, I, I, I'm not sure, I'm not sure if I've like, my perspective on what journalism is and why it matters has stayed pretty constant. My perspective on what my skills are or what is important for the industry have changed, right? So my role at each of those three organizations has been finding an economic model that will allow the publication to continue to do its really important work, right? Figuring out a way that the New Yorker can be engaged in conversations of the day, not just conversations of the week, figuring out a way that it can shift from an ad-led business to a consumer-led business at Wired, you know, figuring out how to rebrand itself to focus more on tech after a little bit of a foray away from hard tech, figuring out a way to build a subscription model, and then figuring out a way to build an affiliate revenue model. And then here at The Atlantic, it's been taking the paywall model and optimizing it through data science and through all the other work we've done. And at all three places, we've had fabulous financial success, taking, you know, making the businesses vastly improved, vastly more sustainable. And through that, increasing the amount of great journalism in the world. Um, and that's you know, when I look at my career and I think about what I'm most proud of, it's not a story. It's not any of the great pieces I've edited or the you know, amazing work I've been part of. It's been, you know, helping each of these three publications in different ways um, get on sounder footing financially at a time where the media industry is getting destroyed. You saw layoffs last week at all kinds of publications, lots of, you know, great publications shutting down. It's been a really hard decade, 15 years, 20 years for the media industry. And, um, you know, I'm very fortunate to have worked with people in places that have been able to buck that trend. What, what does great journalism look like to you? And, and what do you think the media industry kind of more broadly to looks like at its best? Well, to me, great journalism is a story that changes the way people think about an important issue that is told fairly, that is told, ac told accurately, and that is beautifully written. Um, and so my ideal story is one where somebody takes an issue, right? An issue that maybe it's something that we're talking about today, right? It could be Russia, Ukraine. It could be, you know, Israel, Hamas, right? It could be how we think about the end of life. It could be, you know, how to parent, right? Like something that just matters and that then finds a way to change the way people think about it through storytelling, through scenes, through characters, through narrative. And I love those pieces. And I love pieces where I read it. And I think, oh, now I see the world a little bit differently. Like the beautiful thing about it, being a journalist, and one of the things that has kept me in the profession is that you're constantly learning, right? If you're a reporter or an editor, you're investigating different subjects, you're trying new things, you're experimenting. And ideally, you're always approaching it with an open mind. You're always beginning a story with the assumption and understanding that you might be wrong. As you write it, you're learning new things. As you edit it, you learn new things. And it's this wonderful way to increase your imagination and understanding the world. Yeah, I, I, I'm thinking of one of the examples you mentioned kind of brought up. There was a piece in The Atlantic I'm now thinking of that the writer, I think, argued that he didn't want to live past the age of 75. And this had a lot to do with 
one's quality of life or supposed quality of life past those years. And I think the idea was something to the effect of, I really want to feel like at the end of my life or kind of, I, I want the last years of my life to feel pretty good. And like, I've, I've sort of gotten the most out of the time I had, which I think people probably will take very different perspectives on that issue, but the mindset of it wasn't really something I encountered before. And I think that really speaks to your point about changing the way somebody views an issue. Like it's kind of natural to think I want to live as long as possible, but having that different perspective was really interesting too. Yeah. And that's one of the great things about the Atlantic. One of the things the Atlantic does better than I think any other publication in the world is introduce you to ideas you hadn't thought about. Um, Ever since its founding, it's been a magazine of no party or clique. It doesn't fall into ideologies. It doesn't become narrow-minded. It's constantly trying to get you to question your assumptions. And it's really built into the culture here in a way that's delightful. As, as a consumer of journalism, somebody who, who probably reads a lot of things, are there any particular pieces, things you can think of that have really done done this for you, that have changed your view on a particular issue or just brought you to a point that you couldn't have expected before? Yeah, I mean, it often happens with, um, it often happens with sort of long form narrative reporting, right? I, so last night I was reading, um, you know, Charles Duhigg's piece about uh, open AI and the departure of Sam Altman, right? And, oh, okay, now I understand a lot more about where Microsoft was coming from. Now I understand a lot more about the dynamics of this huge debate. You know, this morning there was a piece in the New York Times, a really good piece, Cade Metz, who used to work at Wired, was one of the authors, that made a very smart point through storytelling that if you look at the battles, uh, the sort of the corporate battles in AI, it's personality driven and it's a bunch of very smart, mostly men who are extremely worried about humanity and believe that the only way to save humanity is to let them be in control of the most important technology that will define the future of humanity. It's a, kind of a wonderful way to tell it through scenes and details, an assumption that I knew. But I've also, you know, I've changed the way I think when you talk about aging. I remember Roger Angel's piece in The New Yorker about, you know, understanding how to live with vigor into your 90s, which is kind of the opposite of the piece that we ran um, that changed the way I think about it. Or Peter Sheldahl's piece about dying, which helped me understand, you know, where, how one thinks about the very last stages of life. So it's a, it's a, you know, I remember reading another piece that pops to mind, just maybe New Yorker pieces are free associating here, Larissa McFarquhar on Derek Parfit and his philosophy of, you know, how we're remembered after we die and how we should think about our legacies. Um, you know, all of those have changed the, changed the way I act and changed the way I think. I'm, I'm kind of noticing that you just mentioned to me three pieces that are all on the subject of mortality and dying. And maybe I kind of prompted us that way. But this <laughs> yeah. reminds me of this this really wonderful piece you wrote for Wired about running. And a lot of that was in, a lot of it had to do with mortality, of course. I mean, it kind of goes through four generations of your family. And yeah. I, I think one sentence in it that just really stuck out to me was, and I don't know, I, I don't think this was necessarily a hinge part of the piece or anything, but you kind of articulated running as an act that for you was kind of like a, a proof that you're still alive. And, and that sentence just yeah. really stuck with me for some reason. And so I'm, I guess I'm kind of curious now, you know, is this idea of, of mortality just generally something that you think a lot about in your own writing and reading? Um, a, you're a very close reader to remember that sentence. B, not really. I think it's just because you prompted me with the uh, note about the Atlantic piece. And so those pieces happen to just pop to mind. Uh, I don't think of myself as particularly interested, wise, or focused on mortality. It is true that I do think a lot about you know, the life force associated with running. I'm taking that piece that I wrote for Wired. It eventually will be a book. I'm writing that book. It is about four generations of Thompsons. Um, running is one of the through lines through it, but also thinking about how we're remembered, how we treat our children is an, another one of the through lines. When you write about multiple generations, you, you do have birth and death. Uh, in it. And running is, to me, you know, that sentence came about, um, I ran, the first time I ran a fast marathon, so when I was 30 years old, almost directly afterwards, I was diagnosed with thyroid cancer, scariest medical moment of my life. Two years later, I'd finally recovered and I was able to run again and I ran the exact same time. And, uh, you know, I think I ran eight seconds faster in the New York City Marathon. And it was 
the most emotional marathon I'd ever run because it was just a reminder that I was alive and I could in on one in one way be the person I was before I got sick. Um, so that was why that the the diagnosis of the sickness was intensely related to the marathon because I had put off my physical and then it was you know I put off my physical because I didn't want him to find anything that would make me not run the marathon. <laughs> and then I did it a, you know a week or two after the marathon and would always associate him finding the lump in my throat and then the process that began. Um, so I found that so closely tied to my running. Yeah. I, I know that you did say you're not really interested in mortality, but I guess thinking just about the things that this piece kind of introduces and, and you mentioned that earlier in your career as well, you were really ambitious wanting to do something impactful. Did this all introduce maybe an element of, of urgency to your feelings about what you wanted to do with your career the impact you wanted to accomplish? You know, I think, yes. Um, I do think that, I do think that getting sick and grappling with the possibility that you might not be here in a year definitely um, increases the urgency and the efficiency with which you work and your willingness. I mean, it could have the opposite effect, but for me, it made me want to be, um, you just value time more carefully. And, but then the second thing that did that was having children and, you know, recognizing that when you have children, that any time you spend not with them, you should be spending well. Um, and also your children will look at how you've spent your life and in some ways they'll evaluate it and you want to live up to what you think their, their later versions of themselves will have expected from you. And, you know, I've noticed that my career was pretty choppy um, from about age 22 to about age, I don't know, 31, right? I, like, I was constantly getting rejected from jobs, was constantly not getting the things I wanted. I was constantly just, just sort of being passed over and not, you just did fine. I got hired at Wired. Um, you know, I worked at a really cool place, Legal Affairs, but it was not... It, it, there was a lot of failure in those years. Lots of times where I really wanted something, I didn't get it. And lots of times where I really wanted to write something great and what I finished with wasn't that good. Um, or where I was editing a story and I like, I didn't make it better. I didn't make it into a great story. I didn't, I didn't figure out how to help the writer get the best out of the work. Um, and then in the years that followed, which would be after I started having kids and after I went through that sickness, I did much better, right? And the odds that I would if I wrote something, the odds that it would be good went up. If I edited something, the odds would be good went up. And um, part of it was just, I think, you know, part of it's maturing, learning, and having great mentors. Um, but part of it is also, you know, what I went through physically, and then also, you know, the um, becoming becoming a father, also becoming a father in like a line of a family where, you know, the fathers had disappointed their children um, for generations. Yeah. Yeah. I can, I can, I can see that. I think, um, I don't know. I, I guess I, I don't have kids, so I can't relate to this exactly, but I think I definitely consider a lot of this, like, am I doing something? Am I sort of being a person that a younger me would have been proud of? And I think that's something on my mind a lot. And it's interesting to hear you talk about as an editor, really helping a writer get a lot out of their work because there's at once this, of course, that's your job, but then you're also really helping this person who presumably wants themselves, like you probably did as a writer, to write something impactful, to put something out there in the world. And I guess that's at once, you can think of editing and the kind of copy editing. Does this writing look nice? Is it flowery enough? Is it direct enough? But on the other hand, is it really kind of digging into the writer's soul and like actually putting that out there well enough? I'm, I'm curious kind of how you think about all that from the, from the editing standpoint. Oh, yeah. I, th I think about that. You know, your job as an editor is to identify what the best version of the story could be for the writer, for their goals, for the world, and then to help the writer get there. And to do that, you have to understand the writer's personality, the writer's abilities, the writer's limitations, your abilities, your limitations. So, you know, I, you know, I don't do this anymore, but when I was an editor, I would you know, I would try to evaluate, okay, so what can this writer really do? Like, can this writer 
are they really good at writing scenes? Are they really good at cinematic structure? Are they really good at sentences? Are they really good at reporting? Are they the kind of person who can pull a rabbit out of the hat at the last minute? Or are they a kind of a person who, when the pressure comes, they, you know, they'll stop, right? And with each different writer, they each have a different personality. And so you learn them and you study them and you maybe make mistakes, but some of them, remember one writer at the New Yorker is just popping to mind, you knew that if put under pressure, they would get something incredible at the last minute, right? And it always happened. But you would have to put them under pressure and you would have to get to the last minute and you have to tell them the thing to find, right? Like this story needs this detail and here are some roots to extract it. And they would come back and they would extract it and you'd have an amazing thing and you'd add it like close week. Other writers where, um, you know, that needed to be much more ordered and really they would never get the interesting fact. And so you would have to, when you're imagining the story, you have to accept that you will never get the hidden fact, but you might get wonderful sentences. You might get wonderful structure, right? And there's some writers, you know, there are some writers who are incapable of writing beautiful sentences. And so you have to write sentences for them. And there's some writers who, you know, no matter what you do, you cannot improve their sentences, right? Like I remember editing, oh my God, I would edit Kelly Fasana and Anthony Lane, like neither of them, I could ever improve one of their sentences. It was worthless. Like if I wanted a sentence to be better, I would just say, make this sentence better, <laughs> right? Like, or I don't think this works for this reason. I would never say, try to write it this way or try to write it that way, because inevitably, what I would put would be worse than what they would do. Whereas other writers, I'd be like, hey, how about you write it this way? And they'd say, great, thank you. Um, and so with each writer, you are trying to help them. Your job is to help them get the best out of themselves. You're like, you're like a coach. And some editors misperceive it, and they feel like their job is to get the story to you know, their favorite version of it. And like they insert their skills and they rewrite and they restructure it the way they would have written it. But that's not the way to do it. The way to do it is to imagine the best version of whatever this writer can do and help them get there. And so that was always how I worked. And I loved working with writers on multiple pieces. Um, you know, I formed very close relationships with many of them. Um, we did lots of work over the years, um, you know, and that's it's something I miss now that I'm you know fully in the business side. But I had a, I had a great run at it for twenty years. The way you talk about the whole process of writing and editing, really, I mean, I guess it's kind of obvious from the way you've articulated it, speaks so much to the human interaction aspect of this. And I think as a as a not so subtle segue, this kind of makes me think a little bit about the ways that AI is beginning to affect the journalism industry right now. And this is both on the side of it producing content, but then also on the other side, you can go to ChatGPT or what have you and ask it, could you edit my writing for me? Could you make it better in this way? And there's this declarative sense in which maybe it can do particular things for you. But the, the depth of this human relationship that you're speaking to seems to be missing from that. And I, I don't want to say, you know, a priori, it's impossible that we could ever get to that point. But I'm curious how the way you just talked about this editing writing process informs the way that you approach thinking about some of these issues when it comes to AI and journalism. Yeah, so I, I think there are, there are all kinds of things that AI can't do, right? And it can't have that intense writer-editor relationship. It can't, you know, it can't report, right? It's not gonna be able to go out and make phone calls, right? It can find new things in data sets, it can find new information, but it won't be, it won't probably for at least a while be able to you know, do that thing I was talking about with a political writer where I would say, hey, like, I need you to find like the secret document, right? I, I need you to call three people and convince one of them to talk to you and give you this thing. Um, and, you know, it has a really hard, like AI writes in cliches, right? Just because it's, you know, it's just trying to more or less guess the, based on what everybody has written and it's read lots of cliches. So it reports cliches, right? If you ask AI to write something for you, it's mostly terrible. That said, even now, right, early in this, generation of LLMs, like I love using it, right? So I'm writing this book about running, I will, you know, I will give it a paragraph and say, hey, please copy edit this and offer suggestions to, you know, and I have certain things that I know in my writing I'm weak at, I ask it to, to help with. Um, you know, if I'm stuck, you know, I'm trying, I had this, I was trying to figure out like, if trying to figure out a way to write about why the physiology of running ultra marathons is different from running marathons, right? Obviously, there's some physical differences. There's more muscle pain when you run 50 than 26.2, but like what exactly is going on? And, you know, the way I, 
if I were working as a reporter, I call someone up, you know, call up you know, someone who specializes in this array of papers in it. And I don't know, it was, I just started talking to GPT-4, right? Like, help me understand, like, what is going on early? And like, it just helped me understand it a little bit better. Now, you would never quote it because it might be wrong. Um, there are copyright issues if you quote it. You know, you might plagiarize because it might have spit out something somebody else wrote. But for like understanding an issue, it's like having a infinitely well-read friend on call. Like, in fact, I have a, a weirdly a very good parallel. I used to have this. I, he's still around. I don't talk to him as much. But I had this incredible friend when I was in Washington named Timothy Dickinson, and he had you know, he would spend ten hours a day in the library reading. He um, had near perfect recall. He could multiply six digit numbers by six digit numbers in his head. You had this party trick where he would meet somebody and be like, when's your birthday? And they would say, you know, November 13th, 1957. He'd be like, that was a Tuesday, right? And he had this, and he sort of knew more about anything than anybody, right? He couldn't tie his shoes. He couldn't, he was like dysfunctional in the world, but he had this mind that was out of this world. And so I wrote a book about the Cold War, about the relationship between George uh, Kennan and Paul Nitza. And I just called him up on the phone. I read the whole thing out loud to him. And he went through and he was like, oh, no, that's wrong. Dean Acheson didn't do that in 1952. He was doing this, right? Or he, you know. um, and AI is a little bit like having Timothy. Everybody has Timothy on call, right? You can just say, like, wait, help me understand. Like, why? Like, what exactly is the ethnic clash between the Rohingya and the ethnic Burmans and the, the Karen in the ethnic Burmans, right? Like, I don't, what's going on there? And it will explain it to you. Um, and it's wonderful. And so I use it as a reporting tool, as a thinking tool. Um, I'm just very careful about, you know, in the writing part of my life, which is really just the book, I'm very careful about never using a sentence from it. The way you articulated this is also making me think of how um, Shiv Rao, somebody I spoke to a while ago, who's the CEO of this company building conversational transcription AI for doctors, said something about how using AI systems to automate parts of a doctor's job. So clerical tasks and the like really enables doctors to make the most of their training and kind of humanizes the profession. And I think what you're saying, this almost extended mind way of using these systems as a tool, it, it feels like there's maybe an analog here of how this allows journalists to focus on those more human parts of the profession. I'm, I'm curious if you see that as an analog at all. Maybe. Um, I mean, I definitely think that there are, you know, God willing, like AI makes all, everybody, no matter whether they're a long form narrative writer or CEO, everybody has all kinds of menial tasks that they have to do that take up time that prevent you from doing the stuff that matters. Um, if AI can make those more efficient, that's wonderful. That's true of reporters. It's true of CEOs. It's true of all of us. Um, I also think that there are, you know, when you're a writer, you do spend a lot of time on stuff that It'd be better, like on my book, I'm going to spend a ton of time, right? Like copy editing, right? You know, at the, at the Atlantic, right? They're professional copy editors who are way better than anything AI could produce and they'll make your story better. But I'm on my own writing this book. And so having a, an AI system that will make the copy editing process more efficient um, before I send it off to my publisher and they hire a professional copy editor, that will save a bunch of time that I can then spend thinking about the bigger issues. I think that's absolutely correct. I mean, my general view on AI and writing and journalism and AI and life is that at this point, early on, we should be experimenting and doing as much as we can with it within you know, the general confines of being ethical and aware of its massive limitations. That seems right. And we've seen a few cases of experimentation by this point. I think that um, CNET feels like kind of an example of, of how this goes wrong. Gizmodo had this warning about AI as an existential threat for journalists. And that was, I think, kind of in the wake of the dissolution of BuzzFeed News. And then I saw an even more recent case that was interesting with Sports Illustrated, where they'd been publishing and then removing content by these fake AI-generated writers. And so these are really interesting cases of experimentation. And at the same time, some of the ways in which it's gone wrong so far feel almost comical. Like there's definitely cases here and there where I feel like not a lot of thought has been put into this. And I, I think that maybe I'm not giving people enough credit when I say that, so I don't need to generalize here. But I'm curious in kind of the cases seen so far, like how, how you think about all this. No, you're, those, those, those cases are all absurd and awful. Uh, I mean, Sports Illustrated, it's like, it's an amazing publication with a great history and 
to be buying AI generated stock images and creating fake writers. It's just gross. It's an abomination. It's a dis it's disrespectful to the profession. It's disrespectful to the real people who work there. It sucks. Um, you know, same thing with what CNET was doing. And, um, you know, what would be, what I'm curious about is whether there are other AI use cases that we don't know about, whether writers have actually used it to find things they wouldn't have found or have conversations and, you know, unblock things in their mind, or whether right now it's really just been detrimental. Um, my guess is that there are a lot of writers who are using it in really smart ways to help them think about copy editing, to help them think about story ideas, to challenge some of their assumptions. You know, like I would love if I were, if I were a political writer, you know, a good thing that I would do before publishing a story is I would, you know, take my story, uh, ideally making sure you have you know, privacy rights and feed it to an AI and say, you know, you know please respond you know, with the viewpoint of somebody who has different ideological premises from my own, right? And like, please tell me where they would be needlessly offended. Like when I was, when I was at uh, my previous jobs, I would sometimes right, like read the story out loud to a friend who disagreed with me, or I would just think about myself. Like, let's say I was editing a political story. I would put my mind in, you know, I would pretend that I was my stepfather, extremely smart person with different, you know, political viewpoints. Like, what, what would he think? Where would he say, okay, no, that's not a fair assumption. You can't just put in that aside. You can't, like, have that remark in parentheticals, right? So there are all kinds of interesting use cases um, that I think AI could be used for. We haven't quite figured them out as a profession. Like, journalism has definitely been stumbling in the use cases. And that's why, I, you know, from, from the Atlantic's perspective is no journalist should be using AI in their, their writing at all, which I think is absolutely the right approach. Um, the, the only way, it's kind of interesting. The only way we use AI um, on the journalistic side of the Atlantic, we use it a lot on the business side, is we have it read our stories. And we announce that it's an AI reading it. And it's amazing because it can read it incredibly quickly. It sounds great. And actually, the completion rate is higher when the story is read by an AI than when it's read by a human. Um, and so like, as long as you don't deceive anybody, um, that just seems additive. It's a great experience for our readers. It's a way to get the stories to reach more people. Uh, and that's a big plus. Yeah, that seems right. One of the use cases you brought up here and feels like a, a little bit of a through line for you is this interest in really establishing conversational spaces where people with different viewpoints can kind of come to at least engage in conversation with one another. So you talked about using something like ChatGPT to look at a piece from the perspective of, of a different ideology. You spoke earlier about how you started a magazine in college, you know, for people from different viewpoints to argue with one another. So in, in creating Speakeasy AI, you also talked about wanting to create healthy and safe conversation spaces. And I'd love to hear a little bit about what that looks like for you and what you think is kind of missing in existing conversational spaces that you wanted to deal with. Yeah, so the, the premise of Speakeasy was that conversations on the internet are broken. There are very few places where you can engage in a conversation and emerge from it feeling like you learned something, feeling like your mind has been open, feeling like you're smarter, right? If you go on Twitter and you try to debate something, you'll probably, you know, it will, you'll probably end up just feeling horrible, right? Like, um, same thing with most online forums. You know, there are, there are, there are places on Reddit where you can have good conversations. Um, you know, there are forums where you can have good conversations, but the dynamics of the internet you know, the way the Twitter algorithm works, the way the Facebook algorithm back when this was important to them worked, the way that um, you know, sort of the norms, the way we've learned to communicate, the way that anonymity affects things, um, you know, the way that certain kinds of comments rise to the top, all of that just leads to bad conversations, right? And everybody who tries to have a conversation with the internet knows that. So the premise of Speakeasy was, well, let's try, not, let's try to do the opposite. And so what we did is we built a conversation forum. And it was invite only, it was a small group. Um, where you're invited in, there's a topic, um, you know, whatever the topic is of the day. Like, so today, maybe we'd be arguing about hostage releases. And the way the algorithm would rank order um, comments was based on whether people said they'd learned something new from them, right? Whether they felt like, ah, aha, I've learned something, or whether they said something was provocative, something was clarifying. Um, every nudge on the site was you know, sort of pushing people to engage in positive conversations, to listen to listen to who they were speaking with. We tried very hard to make sure that we had invited an ideological range of people. The whole culture was 
let's learn. Let's try to like, let's get the best viewpoints from everybody else, the way the threading worked. All, every single element of the UX uh, and the design was, you know, to figure out how to help people understand each other. And then we used AI to, you know, back at the time, you know, long time ago, six months ago, um, fairly cutting edge summarization tool to help you understand what was going on in the conversations. Kind of like when you come into a party and someone explains, you know, you know, they're arguing about this, they're arguing about this, they're making this point. And so we built a really cool thing and the conversations were great. Um, we just couldn't figure out a business model um, because like, you can have advertising, you can charge subscriptions. And, um, and so then we tried to turn it into a SaaS product, right? So software as a service and I sort of stepped away. Uh, and now we're, you know, can't say exactly what's going to happen. It's going to be a fine ending, but the, it's going to be a positive ending for everybody who's involved. But the dream of fixing conversations on the internet will have to uh, await somebody else's intervention. Yeah. Can you tell me a little bit more in, in particular, I guess, um, about, so it sounds like there were good conversations here and I'm thinking of this from the standpoint of when you're trying to start anything that involves kind of social conversations online and networking, there's always that sort of scale challenge. But again, I think that for people who are really genuinely interested in just having good conversation, um, this doesn't matter too much. And so it sounds like, again, you haven't fully fixed the issue and there's a lot of steps to go, but I'm kind of curious how you think about now having attempted to fix conversational spaces, what you think the remaining gaps are, if you have more detailed thoughts on it. Well, you know, the scale issue is extremely interesting because scale is a problem, right? You bring more people in, it gets harder to navigate, right? It gets one of the nice things about speakeasy. I don't, let's say there were 500 or a thousand people who were participating um, when we were, when we were running it, um, you know, people knew each other's names, they recognized each other's avatars, they knew their opinions, right? Um, so in a way, having it be smaller was great, right? And having it still be closed was great. Um, the cost was there were people who didn't think it was worth their time because they're, they can go on Twitter and they can post and it'll be seen by thousands or millions, right? So why would they go on speakeasy? And it was hard to get people who had large followings elsewhere to want to post on this beta version of Speakeasy. And we worried that even if and when we opened the gates and allowed many more people in, um, you know, would it, be, would it be worth it for folks, right? You can see this you, as each new social network pops up, right? Blue Sky pops up, Mastodon pops up, Post pops up. With each one, they each, or T2, there are others, they each pop up with this promise of, um, we'll have better conversations here. And they do. The conversations on post are better than the conversations on Twitter, but people drop off, right? And they drop off because they're not getting as much engagement. There aren't as many of their friends there. You know, social networks, they're social networks, right? You want it to be social. You want it to be a network. You want to have more engagement. And they've all, now threads may be able to bust out of this because they've been able to build it on top of Instagram. They have the infrastructure of Facebook. You know, they were able to do it at a time where Twitter is going through a particularly complicated moment. Um, but it's extremely hard to balance um, positive conversations and scale. And Threads isn't really going for it. There aren't, it's, Threads is not a conversation app. Threads is an information sharing app. No one has, has yet cracked um, conversations. I'd like to give it another try before I, before I give up. But uh, you know, Speakeasy didn't, didn't quite work. Is there anything you do differently if you did give this another try? Oh, there's lots I would do differently. I might, um, I mean, maybe the number one choice is I would have built it in such a way that we could have run the conversation um, beta for longer um, and designed it so they're kind of easier entry points and then just let it run for a few more months. Like figure out the finances so that we didn't feel the need to, um, we didn't feel the need to create a business model to, you know, allow us to keep fundraising, right? So basically it's very hard to run one of these. You have to hire product managers, engineers, right? You, um, and you have to go fairly quickly and it always feels extremely urgent. And so you need a bunch of cash. Um, and then when you run out of that cash, if you're not very far along, you have to raise more money and to raise more money, you have to have the business plan. And I kind of wish that we had built it. If we had had three more months to run those conversations before we felt the need to pivot, maybe it would have, maybe we would have been able to solve this. Or, I mean, or if we had a, a better business idea, like we just didn't, we didn't quite know how we were going to support it. Um, 
And when we took it out initially to venture capitalists, they were extremely skeptical. I remember one who was like, explain to me how this gets me laid or it gets me paid. I was like, well, it's probably not going to get you laid or it's not going to get you paid. It's probably just going to expand your mind and make American democracy work better. It's like, if it's not getting me laid or it's not getting me paid, I'm not, you know, it's not going to work. I was like, okay, <laughs> there we are. <laughs> yeah, I, I think this is, this is a reason why I see a lot of, I, I suppose, cynicism or pessimism about just the possibility for something like a good conversational space online to even exist. People will think nobody's going to put money into it. It's very hard to solve the business problem. It's very hard to scale. But from what you've said so far, it sounds like you don't have too much pessimism about this. And I'm kind of curious where that comes from. No, I, I think it's doable. I think that I, I feel like having tried to do it, it you know, you, you might think having tried to do this and having not fully succeeded, though, the outcome's fine. Like we're going to, the technology will end up living on. The, the cool things we built will end up living on. There will be a, a, our investors will get all their money back. No one will lose money and the tech lives on. So it's a happy, happy ending. Um, or, you know, no one will, whatever. More or less, that's correct. Um, I think there's clearly a demand for it. It clearly can work. And as artificial intelligence improves, right? When you, when you were thinking about different ways, you know, we also, the, another problem, we launched this in like October, November, like a month or two before um, ChatGPT came out. And so we sort of launched it in the pre-era, but then had to try to evolve it in the post-era. And if you were to do it from scratch, you know, we talked about, oh, could you have a chat bot that like talks to someone and makes them, you sort of explains to them when their comment is likely to start a flame war or is non-empathetic, right? And not say you can't post this, but just say, hey, hold on one second. You may misunderstand how this, your followers are going to read this, right? Imagine that tool on Twitter, right? And like, I'm about to write something nasty and maybe I don't even realize how nasty it is. And the Twitter bot says, hold on, Nick, like you could rephrase it, you know, or maybe you should change this assumption, or maybe you should think about it this way, or like, just hold on a second. And those are things that are hard, right? Because you have to balance that against like, you don't want the platform to feel like your grandmother, right? You want people to be able to post frequently and you want people to be able to say edgy things. Um, but if you could get the AI interventions right so that you're just nudging conversations in the right way, and if you can get the underlying algorithm right so that it's introducing people who disagree but are open-minded, then you fix those two things. And I think you could have good conversations online. Like I've always thought that one of the most interesting jobs in the world would be working at Twitter, trying to, maybe it's sort of a subset inside of Twitter or it's inside of threads or it's inside of Reddit. Like I always thought that one outcome for Speakeasy that would be ideal would be if the logic that we had built into the code and if the logic that we had built into the UX could eventually end up in one of those major platforms, right? And like maybe there's a subset of Twitter where you try to have positive conversations, or maybe there's a way that Reddit, you know, certain subreddits and certain mods um, adapt it. I thought that was like, I mean, in my long-term vision for it, like that was one of the best possible outcomes. Um, because then you're changing conversations at scale with, you know, all this smart work that our engineers and product people and UX designers had put into making conversations work. Yeah. Another thing I'm thinking about here too is just the power of, you mentioned Reddit, things like community norms and community rules, which I know that each individual subreddit has. And one of my previous guests, June Park, did this really interesting work on something. This was before generative agents, which of course really blew up. But his work on social simulacra was a super interesting way of looking at if we have a social network that has certain community norms and rules, and we can kind of simulate what that social environment looks like with a bunch of agents that are conversing with one another. What happens when we actually begin to scale this thing where we tell everybody, here are the community norms, go discuss. And then what does that look like? And this seems like another kind of promising area for looking at when you are building a conversational space, how, of course, you know, these are going to have limitations. You're using ChatGPT that is particular inflections of its own. But just looking at, you know, before even launching a space, for example, how that plays out also seems like a really promising direction. I mean, it's, we had this funny idea when I was there, when, you know, when we were running Speakeasy and like, what would you do with a troll? And at one point I was like, you know what we should do? If we have a really bad troll. We should just build Westworld, right? And it'll just be all other trolls, but they'll be totally believable and we'll kick the troll into it, right? If you like, if you really like violate all of our norms, we can't handle it. We're just going to put you in Speakeasy Westworld. And you know, and then we'll study 
like what happens and like what happens to the trolls and like different variations of the West worlds, right? And you'll figure out how to solve that problem. But you could also just simulate now entire new worlds with entirely new norms, right? So I don't know what the compute needed would be. You'd ha- I mean, I don't think we're quite there, but you can imagine something like Speakeasy as you're, you know, you're testing five different things, right? And you're testing, let's say we're testing what the reaction should be, right? Like, um, do we reward people for saying a comment was provocative? Do we reward people for saying a comment was clarifying, right? And we're, you know, we made those decisions just by three people sitting around a table. But you can imagine making those decisions by having simulated worlds and changing everything inside of them. And, you know, maybe if I were a mod on a really popular subreddit, you know, I could, you could simulate how that, the conversations on that subreddit would evolve. Now, the danger, of course, is that social media companies will do this and they'll, you know, you'll figure out the rules and you'll optimize not for creating a learning environment and a place where you have positive conversations, but just for engagement, right? And it'll be just be like all the other algorithmic adjustments, which were made for the purpose of engagement and increasing advertising revenue, not for where the KPI was time and money, not, you know, civic engagement. Now, of course, it's hard to measure civic engagement. It's easy to measure time and money. But if you could somehow get out of the time and money KPIs and use these tools to simulate worlds with different directives, you could do a lot of good. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious. Again, this is talking a little bit more in detail about the same theme I touched on earlier, which is this sort of fundamental tension between the KPIs people have for their organizations for social media sites and then the other civic engagement sort of direction, which you've pointed out the legibility problem and then also that other fundamental tension. I guess it's, it's interesting because in, in journalism, again, you also have this sort of aspect of wanting to get people to read stuff that is really engaging, but then you also kind of have to balance the business model and you've sort of seen that from multiple sides now. And so I'm curious if hypothetically, you know, you were from your position, say, stepping in as, you know, I don't know, maybe Elon Musk hands over control of Twitter to you or something. What would you do to turn it into the kind of space that you would want to see if you just took control of one of these sites right now? Yeah, one of the things that I've learned from journalism is that actually the best way to increase engagement over the long run is to not focus on engagement in the short run. And, you know, at all the places I've worked since the modern internet started, which is really three places, just Wired, The New Yorker, or The Atlantic, at no place have we ever looked at what's trending and then assigned a story on what's trending. At no place have we, you know, done a study on what is the most engrossing headline or the best list you could make. You know, at every place when we write a story, we try to SEO optimize it. We try to share it the smartest way on social media. But you assign the stories that you think are the best stories based on the most thoughtful way you can do it. And then you try to get people to read it. And it's counterintuitive to the way most people think journalism operates. Like they think we're sitting in a room here saying, you know, "Ah, how can we get the most people to read The Atlantic? I know we're not. We're trying like, what are the best stories that we can write that feel most true to The Atlantic's history, heritage, and ideals? And I wonder if that would be applicable, right? Like, so what is it that Twitter is really trying to do? Well, so if so, Elon hands over Twitter. Thank you, Elon. Um, You know, what is it that we're trying to do? Well, even with his values, you're trying to have free speech, you're trying to be the global town square, you're trying to be the place where people have, you know, enlightening conversations about topics. So then, all right, so then let's figure out where those conversations happen. And they certainly do happen on Twitter. Let's figure out what it is that drives those conversations. Let's figure out where they go off the rails. And let's change the way the algorithm works, the way the onboarding works, the way that the um, you know, search works. Let's look at all the different variables that push people in different directions and let's start changing them to try to increase satisfaction, right? And maybe let's change the underlying business model, right? So I mean, I like that Elon is thinking about subscriptions, right? If, if you had had subscriptions at Twitter at the beginning, you probably would have a different whole set of different algorithmic outcomes. Um, now, can you, can you add them now? Is it too late? Is the way he's adding them the right way? Of course not. But like, um, you know, there are a whole series of really smart, interesting experiments you could run that I think would gradually make Twitter feel like a place where more of these conversations happen and would make Twitter much more appealing to advertisers. Um, Now, whether they would, you know, burn engagement, who knows? And it's possible that like, they would make Twitter feel more boring. You know, as one investor said to me at Speakeasy, you're trying to sell kale in a candy shop, right? And if Twitter suddenly feels like it's kale, not a candy shop, 
okay, then you've ruined the company. But I don't know. I would, you know, in, in my small world where the economics are, you know, microscopic compared to social media platforms, if you look over the last 10 years and you look who's done the best economically, it's probably correlates pretty closely with who has been most ethical and serious in the stories they've assigned, right? And over time, right, the New Yorker's done great over the last two years. They've actually done amazing, right? The Times has done great. Um, BuzzFeed, which has done some awesome work, you know, trickier journey. So, um, you know, that's the wisdom from the journalism experiment would suggest it's possible in the larger social media landscape. Yeah. And I think maybe taking this a little bit more broadly and kind of for a final section here, We've talked a little bit about specific ways that journalism looks like, ways it intersects with AI. And I kind of want to get your thoughts on just more broadly. You've, you've kind of described yourself as a techno optimist. And I'm curious, just with looking forward, projecting from today, and of course, this is really hard to do to any reasonable extent, what do successful, unsuccessful versions of the future where journalism incorporates AI in a more serious way than it does today, what, what would those look like to you? Well, the most, the most frightening and the most unfortunate would be, I mean, this is my general concern about AI. It's a lot of people's concern about AI, which is it's a force for good. It's a force to make the world better. It's a force to make the world, our lives enriched, but it comes too fast. And because it comes too fast, there's too much churn and society can't adapt. And so the way that happens in journalism is it just turns it all upside down before we have time to figure it out. And so you can imagine tomorrow, Google announces, you know what, we're stopping links, it's all gonna be barred, right? And then suddenly traffic to the Atlantic drops by 45% and our business model collapses. Um, now, if that happens over the course of four years, we adapt, right? And we figure out how to exist in the post Google world. We, you know, new platforms arise, we, we figure out all kinds of things, but there's a rate of change at which we can't adapt. And, that would be the most unsuccessful version, right? So the most unsuccessful version is all the places that do serious ethical work of all political ideologies just are gone, right? And they're you kind of knocked out the way local reporting was knocked out in the last 10 years because the advertising market collapsed because Craigslist, Craigslist wiped out classified ads. You know, God bless Craig Newmark. He's a wonderful guy and a friend, but you know, Craig, Craigslist, like newspapers weren't able to adapt by the pace of the change of the business model. Now, that's partly because they thought too slowly, but also partly because things went too quickly. So my role at The Atlantic is to think as quickly as possible about what's happening and to help us adapt as quickly as possible. But there's a rate of change that even, you know, even publications that are really focused are going to have a hard time. So that's one unsuccessful outcome. Another unsuccessful outcome would be, you know, there's so much garbage on the internet, so many you know, so many deep fakes, so many, you know, fake news sites, right? Well, what we saw in the 2016 election where Facebook, you know, you could write, you know, the Denver Post and the Denver Times, one was real, one was fake. You couldn't distinguish them on Facebook. Um, you can imagine a world where all these fake sites come up, they use AI, they seem real, and eventually nobody trusts anything. And like the internet just becomes a place where you don't believe a single thing you read. And even if it looks like it comes from the New York Times, you've been conned so many times by fake New York Times, um, that you give up, right? That's a bad outcome too. Now, the good outcome is, well, wait a second. So like we learn new ways of using this to make reporting better, faster, more accurate, right? You know, less ideological, right? New publications sprout up that use AI to comb data sets, to you know, figure out ways to um, make the powerful accountable to the press and the people, right? Where Dissidents are able to use AIs in lockdown society to, you know, help correct injustices. So, uh, and where, you know, new business models arise and, you know, we figure out new ways of telling stories at the Atlantic more efficiently. And, you know, we end up, you know, profiting and being able to put that money back into hiring more great reporters and editors. So, you know, which one will it be? Like, who knows, but I'll try my best. Yeah, it's. It's hard to say exactly how things will go, but the issues of synthetic media decline of trust as a result of this that you've brought up here is something that I think I and, and probably a lot of other people have been hearing as a warning for a number of years now. And there are, of course, different perspectives on this and ways that this has 
begun to happen to an extent. But I think that I remember hearing quite a few years ago these really dire warnings about how quickly this could happen. And that isn't to say it couldn't happen from now on, but I'm curious in maybe just seeing what has happened so far in synthetic media and journalism, whether you have any sort of kind of calibration of, you know, the probabilities of of risks like this at all. I'm worried. I'm quite worried. I feel like it's uh, the quality of synthetic data is so high. I mentioned the voices that we use at the Atlantic, right? The quality is so high, right? And we explain it. We use it. Um, you know, voice is simpler than video, um, maybe more complicated than text. But I don't think we're far from synthetic video, synthetic voices. Um, I think the malignant use cases will be obvious. I think they'll proliferate. I think the cost will be low. I think that often with tech like this, we saw this with, with hacking, we saw this with spam. There's like a period where the bad guys win and then there's a period where the good guys catch up, right? And spam was overwhelming and then we got a hold of it. Like hacking was overwhelming and now it seems a little bit better. Um, and I worry that we're about to enter a stage where synthetic media and deception is terrible uh, and then we'll get through it, but we'll see what the costs are along the way. You know, and I, I think the cost to democracy and to social media might be worse than the cost to, to media. There might be the case that fake Twitter accounts are more prevalent than fake newspapers. Um, but I worry, I worry about both over a pretty short, short time period. Those do seem like really reasonable worries. So as you mentioned, your job as CEO of Atlantic is to really kind of respond to all of these developments in technology and see what you can do for, for your journalists, for the Atlantic as a company and, and its finances and all of this. If you were kind of on the other side of this as not somebody having to respond, but you had the ear of kind of all the important AI people and they would do maybe whatever you said, even if it was just in your own interest as an executive at the Atlantic, what would you want the future deployment of this technology to look like? I want people to stop trying to build AGIs. I think that the focus on building human-like intelligence is a mistake. I think that they should instead be trying to expand specific capabilities. And, you know, just as a contrast, right, like last week, DeepMind released AI that will help, you know, improve material science. Maybe it'll work, maybe it won't work. But, but here are new materials that might be stable, that might help you build things, that might have higher heat resistance, whatever. And what could go wrong with that? I don't know. Maybe it will put some people out of business. Maybe there'll be some copyright issues. But really, it's just like this is a great thing that will make society more efficient, that will maybe help us with climate change, will maybe help us you know, build more stable buildings. Whereas AGI, like, sure, it has huge benefits, but massive costs. And like all the costs we talk about with impersonation and um, you know, electoral manipulation and problems to democracy, I think that it's just the wrong goal. Um, and I understand why, like everybody who goes into it, and you listen to Ilya Sutskever, I mean, even you look at DeepMind was founded to, you know, create AGI. I don't know when they moved off of it, but I think that focusing on AGI is creating a lot of these problems. And the fact that OpenAI is constantly trying to make their technology more human-like, right? Like even the way it responds when you type, like it makes it feel like you're talking to a human. I don't think that's helpful. I can see why you do it. It gets more engagement. Um, like a lot more people pay attention to what OpenAI does than what DeepMind does. Um, but I don't think it's good for us. Yeah, this is, this is a really interesting perspective. And I feel like I haven't heard somebody say that so straightforwardly. But I think that there are probably a lot of people who are right there with you on the, again, this is at the very least something that we should really question whether we want people to build at all. Um, and so I, I appreciate your, your point here. I think this is actually a, a really great place to end. And Nick, again, it was really just an honor to speak with you. And I, I appreciated your perspectives and this conversation, and, and I learned a lot. So thank you so much for taking the time. Oh, it's great to talk with you. You obviously read closely, you ask great questions, you listen closely. It was wonderful to talk with you. So, and I'd love to talk more about AGI down the line. That's all I have for today. Thanks so much for listening to the episode. And if you like this, really the best thing you can do is to leave me a review and to share this episode with someone who might find it interesting. You can also subscribe to the podcast in your favorite podcast player. And if you want to keep up to date with the latest from The Gradient to receive emails whenever we have new podcasts, newsletters, articles, 
then you can subscribe to us on Substack where you'll get email notifications for everything.